think we'll cover up to all of uh, next time. Um, I'll talk more about that at the end of class today. Um, I've posted two practice exams. Hopefully you guys have been trying to do those already. Um, I'm going to post those solutions probably sometime today. Okay, so by tonight you'll probably be able to see. Okay. Um, remember, exam review tonight, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and Tuesday um, after this class, or after my other class, Fox, sorry, 9.30 to 11. Um, the one tonight is going to be in uh, this room, HSC 201. Um, the one tomorrow, I don't know, I'll, I'll let you guys know on Blackboard as to when it is, okay, or where it is. Okay, so are there any questions about any of that stuff? Uh, what's going on? The lab practical, I'm just going to give you a note card and you're just going to write answers down on the note card, okay? If it says do a calculation, then you'll do your calculation. Remember, the same thing, box your answers and all of that stuff, okay? Um, okay, so um, other than that, it uh, looks like nobody's got any questions, so let's keep going with chapter six. So uh, we were talking about the kin kinetic molecular theory. Um, and dynamic equilibrium. So this is the process at the molecular level where the same amount of pro product is converting to reactant and reactant is converting to product. So remember, those pictures really do, do a good description of what's going on. So let's look at the, the second one of those two pictures. So uh, the first picture, this shows, you know, at time zero, when we just put the liquid into an evacuated container, okay, so there's no gas up here, okay, so since there's no gas up there, the uh, liquid particles will are going to move to occupy that space, and what you'll notice is that over time, the liquid um, decreases in volume, okay, um, it's because some of those liquid particles, those li liquid molecules became gaseous molecules, of course, Remember, um, uh, gas takes up the entire volume of the container, okay? So it doesn't matter how many particles there are, right? It's only this amount, but it's taking up this whole volume then, okay? But once that happens, once you've got uh, what you would refer to as saturation in the gaseous phase, what happens is that the exact same amount of molecules that are going from the gas to the liquid are going from the liquid to the gas, okay? So you have an equal proportion of these things going back and forth. We call this a dynamic equilibrium. And what you'll find is that a dynamic equilibrium sets up every time you've got two different phases of the same uh, molecule, okay? So uh, in a closed container, okay? So uh, if you're I don't know, boiling water in a closed container, you'll have a dynamic equilibrium of that until it explodes, you know, until something pops off or uh, whatever. So any sort of uh, system will behave this way until the um, disturbance is counteracted. Okay, so um, let's talk about the gaseous phase. So we've talked about... Um, well, let's just talk about the gaseous phase. So the gaseous phase is characterized by low density. Of course, density is mass per unit volume, okay? So remember, gas is very light, right? So the mass is very light, and the volume is very big, okay? So they're very, very low in density, the gases are. So an indefinite shape, that just means it takes on the shape of the container, okay? So if you were to ask, what's the shape of the air in this room, you would say the shape of the room, right? Okay, so it's an irregular shape or a definite shape that depends on the shape of the container, has a very large compressibility. Okay, you can squish gases down very um, well easily. Okay, that's why you can take a big volume of gas and put them into those little pressurized containers. Uh, it's because there's a lot of distance between the actual particles of a gas, right? So when we're looking at a solid, remember, a solid, if we're looking at the individual particles of solid, they're stuck together like this. You can imagine here, I'll just do this. So if I were to want to squish this, I couldn't squish it very much because there's not very much space in between those particles, right? A liquid, it's a little bit less kind of like that. They're still touching each other, but there's a little bit more space, whatever. So you can squish it a little bit. And then a gas, if you think about a gas, 
between those particles so that you can compress them very easily. Thank you. So you can take that space and get rid of it. Uh, so thermal expansion, that's if you have a very cool uh, gas. If you have a very cool gas, um, what you'll see is, well, if you cool the gas down, you may see kind of some sort of mist on the bottom of the container, right? And then you heat it up and it'll expand out of the container. Okay? So it'll replace this, um, you know, space in between those particles. Okay? And you can see that happening here, right? All of those things. Low density, right? Obviously low density. Shape of the container in both of these. So this uh, spigot right here was open and then it allowed the gas to diffuse to the other container here. Uh, large compressibility, of course, you can compress this amount of gas to half that size, right, obviously. That's fairly large when you compare it to solids, right? How much can you compress? You could never compress a solid to half its size. Um, and then thermal expansion, I guess it doesn't really show that very well, but um, you can. Okay, so let's talk about ideal gases. Okay, ideal gases are model gases, and the way gases are supposed to behave, or ideally behave, of course there's no such thing as an ideal gas, it's like any sort of ideal whatever, it's uh, not something that exists, but something that you would uh, think about attaining to, okay, so it's a theoretical gas made up of what we call randomly moving point particles. Uh, and a model of the way that gases behave at the microscopic level. Okay, so um, even though this doesn't really exist, it's good to think about and you can start um, making up equations about ideal gases and they really um, correlate to what uh, gases um, behave like naturally. Okay, so natural gases behave like. Um, so when we're thinking about the ideal gas concept, we can measure uh, the following variables of gas, a temperature, the temperature of a gas, the volume of a gas, the pressure of a gas, and the mass of a gas. So we want to remember that no truly ideal gas exists, but noble gases and simple nonpolar um, diatomic gases like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, um, well, fluorine is fluorine, I guess, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and all the noble gases, they beha behave very, very similar to what we would describe as an ideal gas. So very nearly ideal um, behavior at ordinary <coughs> temperatures and pressure. Okay, of course, if we uh, put a lot of pressure on these um, particular substances, so uh, we've got like thousands and thousands of atmospheres of pressure on them, or we cool them down very, very low temperatures or heat them up to very, very high temperatures, uh, they don't always behave ideally, but it's still a useful model. Okay, so these are the things that we're going to be emphasizing, temperature, volume, pressure, and mass. So what happens is we can systematically change one of these properties, and what will happen is uh, the other three will change. Okay, so we'll see the effect on all the other three. So uh, we want to talk about, so we re remember kinetic molecular theory, let's uh, think about ideal gas kinetics, okay? So this isn't, um, again, this is ideal stuff, okay? So gases are made up of small particles that are constant random motion. The distance of separation is very large compared to the size of the individual particles. So what that means is gases are mostly empty space. Again, why you can compress them very <coughs> easily. Um, all gas particles behave independently. Okay, so this is the first um, attribute um, that doesn't uh, uh, refer to uh, known gases, only ideal gases. Okay, so they say no attractive or repulsive forces exist, exist between them. Of course, all substances have attractive and um, repulsive forces, but we're talking about ideal gases. Okay, so gas particles can collide with each other and the walls of the container without losing energy. Of course, when you collide with things, you're going to lose a little bit of energy. Again, this is talking about ideal gases. And the average kinetic energy 
uh, the particles increases or decreases in, pro in proportion to the absolute temperature. So what does that mean? As the temperature goes up, the particle speed goes up. So you get more excited, uh, more um, flowing when you uh, increase your temperature. Okay, so again, gases are easily compressible. This is why when you go to the fair or whatever and you see the clown like spinning the balloons, like twisting them up into animals like here, um, it's because there's mostly empty space. You can twist them like that, okay? So um, room for the particles to be put together. Um, gases will expand to any available volume. You know that by looking at a um, hot air balloon. Um, gases have low density. Also, you can talk about a hot air balloon, right? The hot air balloon flo floats away. It's low density, right? So things with lower density are on top of things with higher density, right? So uh, the gases in a hot air balloon are actually lower in density than the air around them. Um, that's why they float away. So the gases have low mass per unit volume. Uh, they read readily diffuse through each other. It's because, you know, there's so much space. So if I were, so all gases are, you can mix all gases um, together readily, right? So if I wanted to mix the green and the white gas here, it would be easy because there's so much space between them that they're not kind of repelling each other. There's no like polar, non-polar stuff going on here. Gases exert pressure on their containers. Okay, you uh, uh, probably know this before and after you open like a two liter bottle of soda. You can feel the uh, carbon dioxide uh, that's in the soda bottle prior to opening it uh, very pressurized, okay? So it makes the bottle very stiff. Of course, when you open it for the first time, it becomes very, you know, less stiff, very much less stiff, right? It's because all that gas was released. Um, the pressure was released because the gas was released, right? So this pressure, pressure results from collisions of gas particles with the container of the wall. So they're constantly colliding uh, back and forth uh, and giving this pressure. And so there are no ideal gases, again, the gases which behave most ideally are nonpolar molecules at low pressure and high temperature. Okay, so we've been talking about temperature, and we remember temperature, hopefully. Uh, you remember how to convert from temperature scales. Uh, whenever you're talking about ideal gases and uh, using these gas laws that we're going to be talking about, uh, all of your temperatures have to be in the Kelvin scale. Okay, so it's the absolute uh, temperature scale, and that's the temperature scale that molecules and atoms and other particles behave um, behave according to. Um, of course, Fahrenheit and Celsius are kind of made up temperature scales, human made up. Uh, the Kelvin one is again an absolute uh, temperature scale. So um, the temperature of a gas sample is the measurement of its average kinetic energy. Remember the hotter the sample is, the more energetic the particles are, okay? Um, the Kelvin temperature scale, like I said, is gonna be used in all of our calculations in this chapter. Uh, remember, absolute zero is the temperature of zero K, zero Kelvin. Uh, this is the temperature which uh, all molecular motion ceases, okay? So that means that the average kinetic energy is zero. Okay, so at this temperature, kinetic energy becomes zero because all motion stops. And uh, remember, on the Celsius scale, absolute zero is negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you may be having to convert back and forth from, temp from uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Okay, but remember, always you're going to be using Kelvin in these temperature um, calculations. Uh, this here is an uh, equation to relate uh, temperature and kinetic energy. Uh, you guys don't have to worry about it, okay? I think it's a little advanced for that. Um, let's talk uh, a little, we'll go back to pressure, talk a little bit more about pressure. So pressure, again, is the force pushing on a unit area of the surface which the force acts. So what, what, whatever that means, right? So it's just these little balls hitting against the walls of this container. 
is giving this thing pressure. It's the force exerted by the collision of particles within the walls of the container. It's often expressed in units related to the measurement of atmospheric pressure. Okay, so what you feel on top of us right now by the air is called atmospheric pressure. And especially since we live at about sea level, right, we're getting about one ATM on us right now. So um, ATM is the unit of pressure that you're going to see most often, and it's the unit of pressure that you're going to have to convert your um, pressure units to in order to uh, use it in the ideal gas laws. Okay, so uh, now we've got two measurements that we need. So for temperature, right, we want to convert that to Kelvin. The pressure, we want to convert to ATM. Okay. So um, here you can see uh, standard atmosphere of pressure. One ATM is the pressure needed. Uh, this is the way that uh, another way of looking at it. It's the pressure needed to support a 760 millimeter column of mercury in the barometer. So, uh, if so, what happens here is if you got a pool of mercury and you invert a glass tube that's closed on one end. What'll happen if you stick that inverter tube into your glass dish here? The pressure of the atmosphere will push down on that di that the liquid in the dish and make the um, column of mercury go up that inverted tube. Okay. So what happens if you're at sea level? What you'll find is the height of this tube here, the height of the mercury in that tube, is 760 millimeters. And that's where, you, if you've ever heard of this pressure reading millimeters of mercury, this is where that comes from. So this is, uh, you know, the uh, barometric pressure a lot of times is given in tor or millimeters of mercury. Okay. So um, uh, one tor is the pressure needed to support a one millimeter mercury of co uh, column of mercury in a barometer. So the pressure of uh, 760 tor equals one ATM. Okay. So a uh, pressure of one tor, the column would be like up to there, right? So the pressure of one tor is like 100, one 760th of atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, so again, uh, as Earth's gravitational field pulls gases in the air towards the center of the Earth, this is what's happening. This is what gives us the pressure. Uh, it results in a force that's uh, on all objects of uh, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, so that's also one atm. Okay, so 14.7 pounds per square inch equals one atm. 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atm. 760 tor equals one atm. Okay, so tor and millimeters of mercury are the same thing. Okay. Tor is just some guy's name, Tor. He, uh, T O R R. He, uh, long since dead now, uh, and he did a lot of measurements of mercury. So this instrument that we've created here, this mercury dish with an inverted tube in it, it's known as a barometer. So it's the uh, instrument used for measuring relative atmospheric pressure. And like we said, the mercury goes to a height of about 760 millimeters um, above the dish at sea level, like what we're at about right now. Okay, so what you can do, um, so uh, let's see, the di diameter of the barometer doesn't matter uh, as long as you have enough mercury within the dish. You can have a fat barometer or a very skinny barometer, it'll go up to the same height, okay? Of course, if you didn't have enough mercury in that dish, it wouldn't, but say you did have an infinite number of mercury, an uh, infinite amount of mercury. So the ratio of the weight to area always stays constant, so the mercury will always rise to 760 millimeters, um, and the pressure is inversely proportional with the height. Um, so the higher you go, the less pressure you got. Um, 
So what you see here is a height of zero meters, so sea level, right? So you got a pressure of 716 millimeters of mercury. But if you go, I don't know, up to the top of a very tall mountain, 8,848 feet high, right? You see that the pressure drops dramatically, 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so here's some more units of pressure that you may have heard or seen. Um, PSI is also pound per square inch. Um, and you can see that uh, the ones that we want to be concentrating on are atmospheres or in millimeters of mercury, but just to convert to atmospheres. So what you can find is that if you've got uh, the density of two liquids and the height of one liquid, you can figure out what the height of the other liquid would be, right? So if we knew um, that at, let's see, we have the density of mercury up here. I think the density of mercury is 14 point,
So if you recall this experiment that we've already done, um, ammonia diffused uh, 12.8 centimeters in 33,760 seconds, and ammonia diffused 69.85 centimeters in the same time, right? So if you notice, this is much smaller um, distance than this, okay, so about 3.5 times as small. Um, and if you look here, you'll see that HCl and NH3, ammonia and hydrochloric acid, right, uh, ammonia is a much smaller molecule, okay, so it's going to move faster. This is actually what happens, is that um, if you've got uh, smaller molecules, they move faster. Uh, lighter molecules uh, move slower. Slower. You can com you can think about this like by trying to compare um, uh, throwing it like a golf ball up in the air relative to a bowling ball up in the air. You know which one would be easier to throw around? It's because of the relative weight of the two particles. Okay. Um, so effusion as opposed to diffusion, okay? So effusion is the process by which individual molecules flow through a hole without collisions between the molecules. So it's like these ducts in a row, right? So the, they're all flowing through the same particle, are all throwing, flowing through the same pore, but they're not, uh, they're not contacting each other. Okay, so you can see it maybe better here. So, uh, Graham's law of effusion, for gases at equal temperature and pressure moving through one or another or through a different solvent, it's observed that the rate of one gas over the rate of the other is equal to the square root of the, or the molar mass of one over the other. Okay. So again, this is similar to this, right? If I have the rate of gas one the rate of gas two, you should be able to, or if I have the rate of gas one and know the molar mass of both of them, you should be able to find the rate of uh, the second gas, okay? So these rates will be given to you in like meters per second or something like that, okay? So um, we could think of an example, right? Let's go back to these. So, say, well, we know the molar mass of HCl is 36.5 grams per mole. The molar mass of NH3 17.9 grams per mole. If we just said that the rate of one of them, I don't know, is um, 11,000 meters per second, so that would be the, we'll say the rate of H, well, we'll just do that, NH3. What's the rate of HCl? You should be able to figure that out. So when you go when you go back and look at these numbers relative to how far they went centimeters per second, it won't it won't uh, add up. Okay, so if you try to do this, you won't it won't obey this law here. Okay, because this is effusion, not diffusion. But anyways, do you you cool with that? Yeah, I know. Go back there. They're um, on the website somewhere. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we understood why this experiment was giving us the numbers that it was, okay, and that they were different than this law here. Okay. Okay. So that's all the lead up, really, to the gas law. So I really want you to be able to do the diffusion stuff and um, this uh, density to height stuff, okay? I really do. Uh, let's talk about the gas laws now, okay?
Okay, so gas laws are mathematical equations. So we're going to be doing a lot of these different equations with a lot of different variables starting now. Okay, so the gas laws are mathematical equations that describe the behavior of gases as they're mixed, subjected to pressure or temperature changes, or allowed to diffuse. So gas laws involve a number of relationships between number of moles, volume, temperature, and pressure. So you got to remember how to calculate moles from grams and all of that. Okay, this is why we concentrated so much on that earlier in the term because we're going to be hitting this really hard. Um, uh, yeah, the pressure and temperature are very important, obviously. So um, the gas laws. Here's three of the gas laws. Uh, one of them is called Boyle's law, Charles law, Gay-Lussac's law. There's another one called Avogadro's law as well. And then there's the combined gas law and the ideal gas law as well. But these are three out of the six that you'll know by the end of this chapter. Okay. So again, they're mathematical equations relating pressure, temperature, and volume of gases. And they're named after the scientists who first discovered them. So notice Boyle's law is uh, the measure or the uh, relation between pressure and volume. Charles Law is between pressure and temperature. Gay Lussac or volume and temperature. Gay Lussac is between pressure and temperature. And Avogadro's is between uh, number of moles and volume. Okay. So uh, there's Boyle. Okay. Long dead guy, obviously. Um, so what he came up with was that the volume occupied by a gas is inversely proportional to the external pressure. So if you have these at constant temperature and number of moles of gas, so if you don't add or take gas away, uh, the volume will be inversely proportional to the temperature. And that makes sense, right? Because, uh, or the pressure, because pressure kind of keeps volume in. Okay, so if you're squishing something down, right, you're going to make, if you got a lot of pressure on something, it's going to be very small, right? Does that make sense? Right? So uh, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So you can, it's again, it's like these types of problems, okay? So let's try this one together. A gas at 10 liters, uh, occupies 10 liters at 1 atm. If we double the pressure to 2 atm, what's the volume? Let's figure this out together.
Gay-Lussac's law is the pressure of a gas is proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas. There's Gay-Lussac. Okay. So Pi over Ti equals Pf over Tf. So very similar uh, to Charles' law.
Um, and you guys can try it, try it on your own here. Okay. We can again if you want. If you guys want to do these during the review tonight or tomorrow, it's no problem. You know, we can go through all of these. Okay, but I'd like you to try this one on your own. So you're gonna have to remember these formulas. Okay, these five formulas that we've gone over. In fact, we're gonna learn a couple more. Um, the combined gas law is uh, derived from a combination of Boyle's law, Charles law, and Gay Lussac's law. So what you find is if you squish all of those laws together, you can make this law, which is the combined gas law, Ti times Gi over Ti equals Cf times Cf. of 1 and 2, okay, that's the um, more antiquated way of talking about initial and final, um, so they'll say 1 is initial and 2 is final, okay, so if you see those, don't be freaked out about it, it just means that, uh, you know, initial and final. Um, here you can see a uh, combined gas law problem, um, it's set up for you, okay, set up for you here. You can see, again, we need to convert our degrees Celsius to Kelvin. Okay. Notice our pressures are in ATM. If our pressure were in millimeters of mercury, we would have to convert that to ATM. If it were in four, we'd have to convert that to ATM. Um, I'll give you the conversion factor for pounds per square inch to ATM if I wanted you to do that. Okay. Um, four millimeters of mercury, you should know. It's 760 to 1. Okay. Four and millimeters of mercury are the same thing. 764 equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Equals 1 ATM. Okay. Um, here's another combined gas law problem. Another combined law, gas law problem. And then the last thing we'll talk about is Avogadro's law. Um, Avogadro's law is Equal volumes of gas contain equal numbers of molecules. So the volume occupied by a gas is proportional to the number of moles. So notice it's very similar to Charles' law. Uh, instead, it's Vi over Ni equals Vf over Nf. Okay? Or very similar to Gay Lussac's law. Okay? They're all very similar to each other. It's just uh, these four laws um, kind of correlating two of these four variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and number of moles. Remember, number of moles you can get by get if you're given the molecular weight and the number of grams, okay? So you're going to be given that a lot, okay? You're going to be given the number of, the mass number of the stuff, you know, the mass. You're going to have to convert it to moles and then do this gas law problem. Um, and uh, for Avogadro's law, um, a very interesting thing that you'll figure out is that at, um, well, you'll have a molar volume because all moles, like a mole of hydrogen, contains the same number of particles as a mole of uh, bromine does. Okay, right? That makes sense. They both contain 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles, right, per mole. Any mole, a mole of platinum contains the same amount, right? So what you find is if the, the volume is proportional, directly proportional to the number of particles in the, um, in the sample, what you'll find is that if that's the case, then any sample that contains a mole of particles, of gas particles, will be the same volume, okay? And at standard temperature and pressure, of course you can't be varying the temperature and pressure, so if you say the standard temperature and pressure is zero degrees Celsius and one ATM, 
2.4 liters and a mole of, I don't know, what's the next one? Argon is what? 22.4 liters, yeah, it's pretty funny, right? 22.4 liters, that's hilarious. Okay, so hopefully everybody's got that, okay? Um, that'll be the last thing we do today. And um, study hard, okay? I'll see you guys tonight from 6 to 8. So there's not going to be any office hours after class today. Remember those of you who are in my Monday lab, especially because those are the guys I care about the most. Uh, <laughs> well, what can I say? Uh, that we have the lab practical today. Okay, so normal lab time. Don't meet in the, the uh, lecture hall. Just meet in the, the lab room, and we'll line you guys up. question if you remember it, but you think you'll put a question like that on the exam to kind of test what question? the 22.4, like if you remember that one mole at 273k It is, is something that we've gone over in class, you know. That'd be so cool, because that's like, because as long as you remember that's pretty, it'd be pretty easy to solve something like that.